Okay. Welcome to the policy day of the 2020 conference of the Partnership for Economic Policy. My name is Nisha Arunathilaka, and I will be your master of ceremony for today's event. Before we begin, we want to share a few technical instructions regarding your participation. First, you should know that live interpretation in French and English will be available throughout the event. Most of the event will be in English. For those who prefer to listen in French, go to the bar at the bottom of your Zoom window, click on interpretation and select Francais. One panelist will be speaking in French at which point all other participants should do the same, but select English. We will let you know when it is time. Secondly, there are three ways to share comments and questions during this event. The chat, the Q&A, and the raised hand. If you have questions specifically intended for the speakers, you should post them in the Q&A room. Questions will be selected from this space and communicated to the presenters at the appropriate time. The chat is where you can exchange with all participants. Comments posted in the chat are visible to all. And so we ask everyone to remain courteous and on topic. You can use the raise hand button when you wish to share a comment or question verbally, but this will be allowed only during specific periods. Please note that with such a high number of participants, it is possible that we won't have time to address all questions and comments, but we will do our best to feature as many as possible. There will be also an opportunity for everyone to share their views through an interactive survey in the second part of the event. Now we will move on to the program. The program of the event is detailed on the PEP website with links to each speaker's profiles. The link is posted in the chat room. We will begin with welcome remarks from our hosts and partners followed by a keynote presentation and a first question and answer period. Then in one hour, we will take a 15 minute break and come back at 1.15 p.m. universal time for a panel discussion in which you will also be invited to participate. We will conclude with a review of the key takeaways from the discussions and some concluding remarks from our host who will also present the winners of the 2020 edition of the PEP Best Practice Awards. So now without further ado, allow me to introduce our first speaker and host, Professor Jane Kapubo Mariara, who is the Executive Director of the Partnership for Economic Policy. And we will begin the introduction, um, and she will be beginning the, with the introductory remarks. Jane, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Nisha. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone uh, joining us from across the group. Hello to our special guests, uh, including Martha, who will be speaking to us. Uh, Paul Okwi, Robert, uh, Catherine, and Alian Dehan from the International Development Research Center, Heren Oriaro from the Canadian High Commission here in Nairobi, and the Global Affairs Canada. And I am sure that Kali from Global Affairs Canada is also joining us. Uh, I welcome all our other special guests, including our own. Uh, PEP Board of Directors. I welcome uh, representatives of our partners, presence, all our collaborators, and everyone else. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, this morning. 
uh, or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, as executive director of the Partnership for Economic Policy, it gives me great pressure to welcome you to the 2020 PEP Policy Conference. This is our first ever online policy conference. It is held as part of our annual conference of activities, uh, which have been taking place online since 22nd September uh, of, 20, of, of, of 2020. Uh, for those who are maybe less familiar with uh, PEP, uh, the Partnership for Economic Policy is a group of organization uh, dedicated to driving development in the global south. Uh, we believe that every country needs and deserves to have local expertise to inform decisions about their future and development. Uh, we support teams throughout the global south as they produce high quality policy engaged evidence to inform decisions at home. Each year, we bring these research teams uh, together for training to share their work and to learn from one another at our policy conference. So really, today's event is a culmination of four weeks of activities for 14 research teams who are now in the final phase of their PEP projects. These teams are among the first cohort of PEP research co-producers. Uh, local academics and government officers are working together to generate scientific evidence that will inform specific policy decisions. Our conference activities aim to equip these teams for the next stage of their projects, that is in disseminating their results. Uh, the activities that we have had have included training for effective policy communication and peer review sessions where they present uh, their findings uh, as both research results and policy recommendations. These activities have uh, were, were concluded yesterday. Uh, last year, PEP adopted the co-production model to improve the information and tools that our teams provide to local decision makers. Although these new co-production projects are ongoing, some are already informing practices in their countries. I'll give you two very quick examples as I finish. We have an example in Nigeria where representatives of government agencies and local research institutions decided to create a joint communication framework based on an example that the PEP project provided. Uh, their framework will encourage the exchange, integration, and co-production of knowledge. Uh, meanwhile, in Senegal, two institutions have adopted the practice of developing papers to communicate policy advice. One is a ministry and one is a research institute and each is linked to a different project team. The ministry has also provided training to its staff in this area. These examples show how PEP support empowers local leaders to foster changes that improve evidence use in policy decisions. We are continuing to support co-production research through a series of new projects that will inform policy responses uh, to the urgent issues that affect us, uh, including climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. We must turn to evidence to find a way out and a way forward. Our mission to support and promote high quality policy engaged evidence not only remains relevant under these circumstances, it becomes absolutely essential. However, uh, research co-production is challenging. Uh, today's discussions will explore how we can overcome these challenges to increase the impact of the evidence and the effectiveness of policy decisions. We have invited teams from ongoing projects to share their experiences and draw lessons 
on how to make this relationship even more fruitful in the future. Uh, on behalf of PEP, I thank our fathers, that's Canada, uh, uh, Canada's International Development Research Center, IDLC, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, uh, Global Affairs Canada, uh, UK Aid, the World Bank, uh, UNICEF, as well as our partners and collaborators for their enduring support. We look forward to a very productive future. I hope today we will all find the discussions very useful and I wish us all a very interactive and productive event. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Mariara. Our next speaker is the chairman of the PEP Board of Directors, Dr. Fred Carden. Dr. Fred Carden, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nisha, and thank you also, Jane. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to join you for the 2020 conference of PEP. Um, my name is Fred Carden. I've been on the board of PEP for about three, three and a half years, but this is the first year I've participated as the chair of the board, and it is indeed a privilege. Uh, you may know that we welcomed three new members to the board this year, when the mandates of three of our founding members, including the former chair, ended. Uh, so we want to thank the outgoing chair, Mustafa Nabli, as well as Marie-Claude Martin and Pramila Krishnan for their support and their guidance over their terms, uh, supporting the creation and continuity of PEP. The current board members are Harun Borat, who's a professor and director of the Development Policy Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. Santiago Levy of Mexico, formerly with the Inter-American Development Bank and now a senior fellow of the Brookings Institution. Hanan Morsi, who is the director of macroeconomic research at the African Development Bank. Carol Newman, who's a professor at Trinity College in Ireland. Dominic van der Waal, who's a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington and a visiting professor at the University of Malaysia. And finally, Zhao Bojang, who's a professor at Peking University. And I wanted to mention them all because uh, unlike in the past when we were able to be together, you won't have an opportunity to meet with them and mingle. Uh, and I really appreciate all of their support uh, in the governance of PEP. Uh, as Jane said, PEP research projects are designed to produce evidence that will feed government advice and decision-making processes. And it's indeed wonderful to see that more than half of the PEP teams report that their findings are indeed taken up one way or another to inform policy. And I think the main reason for that success is that the projects that we support are designed and conducted in continual consultation with policy actors. And that's why the theme of co-production that Jane mentioned is so important and why we think it is being so successful. We know these, make it, these collaborations make a real difference in the policy making process. For our work to be effective, we must adapt and respond to key emerging issues. Jane mentioned climate change. She also mentioned COVID-19 crisis. And we've addressed COVID-19 through a research call, as well as some of the changes I'll mention briefly. We've expanded our research fellows program, which is a fellowship of senior experienced PEP researchers who are conducting a short-term rapid turnaround policy response research and thereby also increasing our visibility in the wider development research community. We are supporting the co-production projects that Jane mentioned. We supported, selected 20 projects last year. PEP will select another 15 this year. Um, and for the teams whose research was already underway, uh, the COVID crisis has changed the way we offer scientific support. Uh, because local mentorship is no longer possible. So much more frequent and distant member, mem mentorship has replaced the study visits and quite successfully. The crisis has certainly hindered dissemination activities for the teams. Many national policy conferences and stakeholder meetings have been canceled. International conferences have been postponed or moved online. But our teams are finding ways uh, to share their research. And I'm proud to say that despite these exceptional circumstances, 
The current project teams have managed to achieve their milestones. They've delivered high quality research results and high quality policy recommendations. And your mentors, we thank them as well for, and we thank you all for your hard work and your dedication to the research and the mission of PEP. Many research institutions have been hard hit by the economic crisis, just as their expertise are needed more than ever, the support is becoming more challenging. So PEP is extremely grateful uh, to our donors, as Jane said, to IDRC in Canada, the Hewlett Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, Global Affairs, Aid, the World Bank, and UNICEF. As I mentioned above, uh, many of the findings are informing policy decisions, the findings of PEP projects. And we're all here today because we believe that to derive development policy decisions, they must be informed by high quality and especially locally generated evidence. And we hope you all agree that PEP does, does exactly that. And we invite current and potential funders to talk to us about what PEP has to offer. On behalf of the board, I would also like to thank Jane and all the PEP staff for their de dedication, for their adaptability and flexibility in the, through this crisis and all of the extra challenges thrown at them this year. Thank you and have a very good conference. Thank you, Dr. Carden. Now for the last of the welcome remarks, I invite Dr. Martha Melis, who is Acting Program Leader for Employment and Growth at the International Development Research Center of Canada. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Perfect. So let me add to the warm welcome, a uh, virtual welcome to all. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, representing IDRC. My name is Martha Meles. I am acting leader for the Employment and Growth Program at IDRC. For those who are not familiar with IDRC, uh, we are part of Canada's International Development Assistance. Our mandate is to help developing countries find lasting solutions to the social, economic, and environmental problems they face. And we do this by supporting research and evidence and by nurturing its use. Why do we do this? We believe that research has an important role to play in informing policies and interventions, and that it is catalytic to finding lasting solutions for improving the lives of uh, poor and marginalized people. And as was mentioned, uh, no time is the role of research and evidence more critical than the current COVID reality where governments are faced with the challenge of developing timely, effective and inclusive measures to help individuals, families, businesses, communities cope and mitigate the social and economic impacts of the pandemic. Research can indeed provide answers to key policy questions and help inform the design of policies and practices to make a real difference in people's lives. But we also know too well that the research and policy link is not an automatic one. And the kinds of questions the researchers seek to provide answers to are not always the questions that keep policymakers up at night or that the solutions proposed are not always feasible. So catalyzing the nexus between research and policy to foster evidence-based decision-making is a key priority for IDRC. In fact, for us, research quality goes beyond just scientific rigor. It encompasses the relevance of the research and its positioning for use. And one of the ways in which this can be enhanced is through the co-creation of the knowledge agenda which is the theme of this year's uh, PEP annual conference um, very aptly. We are very honored to have partnered with PEP for more than a decade now. Uh, as many of you know, PEP has grown to be one of the leading Southern Bay's networks that not only is making a significant contribution to the generation of knowledge and evidence, but it's also committed to ensuring that the research feeds into policy processes to make a difference and improve the lives of those who need it the most. 
Um, I will stop here so I don't take too much time from the important discussion that, that lies ahead. And I look forward to this uh, timely discussion and to learning from the rich experience um, and expertise represented here. And um, Jane mentioned many of my colleagues, including our regional director and our, um, our area di director is also present here. So on behalf of all of us here at IDRC, I welcome everyone and we are very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melise. This concludes our welcome remarks and now we uh, proceed with the keynote presentation. The keynote will be hosted or co-presented by two experts, Dr. Anita Kothari and Mr. David Roger Valugembe from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Dr. Anita Kothari is an associate professor at the University School of Health uh, Study, Study Yates. Her research focuses on understanding how to best support the use of research and knowledge in healthcare decision making. Within this domain, she concentrates on integrated knowledge translation and research co production, particularly in public health systems and services. She is also a member of the College of the Royal Society of Canada. Mr. Valugembe is a PhD candidate in health information science with expertise in health policy communication and implementation, knowledge translation, stakeholder engagement, and sustainability, focusing particularly on maternal and child health. Following their presentation, there will be a period for them to answer questions from the audience. And so we invite you to use the Q&A space to share your questions for the speakers during the presentation. You can also use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And we will enable you to speak, but only at the appropriate time. Dr. Anita, uh, Mr. Valugambe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it'll just take me um, a, one second to get my shared screen going. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Hello, David. Hey, We're in two different rooms. Um, thank you for uh, attending this morning. Um, and honestly, I don't know if I'm more nervous doing it a presentation this way or with everybody in the room, but uh, I guess this is the new normal. Um, thank you very much for the earlier introduction, Misha. Um, the only thing I want to add to that is that uh, um, David and I do come from the health perspective, but we, we acknowledge that there are um, different kinds of uh, projects and disciplines that are represented among the viewers. David? Um, thank you very much, Anita. And, um... As shared, my name is David Roger Walugembe, and I'm a PhD health information science candidate at the University of Western Ontario. And as introduced, my work is mostly around health policy implementation, knowledge translation, uh, maternal and child health, as well as stakeholder engagement and sustainability. And Anita is my supervisor at the University of Western Ontario. So the purpose of our presentation today is basically to describe research co-production in the context of development research and um, to highlight the nuances related to research co-production and power, sustainability, digital inequality, and industry partners. We also aim to uh, provide uh, recommendations for researchers, funders, and policymakers on how to ensure the success of collaborative research initiatives in developing countries. Um, so we're, we're going to get right into it and talk a little bit about um, some of the motivations for the research co-production agenda. Um, about 
30 years ago, um, it was observed that researchers and knowledge users come from two very, very different worlds that have different languages, different expectations, different timelines, um, and different reward structures. Um, and this was called the two community problem. Um, so that, that's one of the motivations. Um, but another motivation is that we're seeing um, generally that um, service providers, managers, policymakers, and society in general um, is calling for a shift in the way that we do research. And, it's, and, and there is a call to move away from investigator-driven research to a model that um, really takes into account a service, the service provider or um, that's very community-centered. And then we're noticing in our sector that healthcare organizations are recognizing the need for patient involvement or public engagement in the kind of work that they're doing. And then finally, um, policymakers and funders, of course, want to see a return on their investment and they want to see um, relevant research, which then is taken up and applied. So basically, when we talk about the motivations for research co-production, um, we're seeing a, a move to democratize the knowledge production process or the research process. Um, so again, just kind of introducing this, this area. So research co-production, which has also been called integrated knowledge translation in Canada, is a model of um, collaborative research where researchers work with knowledge users. So knowledge users could be um, policymakers, they could be managers, they could be administrators, they could be service providers, um, anyone who's gonna be using the research um, who identify a problem. And, and this is very important, they're in a position to actually act on the research findings. And so as, as you've probably um, thought or guessed, you know, research co-production does share many of the traditions of the classic community-based participatory research or, or participatory action research. It is a collaborative approach to the research process, but it's very much focused on research-based solutions and the uptake of those solutions and the, input, and the um, implementation of those solutions. So essentially, research co-production is about conducting research that's directly relevant to knowledge users, research that is directly relevant to the field, whether that's policy um, or, um, or in a service provider kind of setting. Um, one of the things I just want to point out quickly is that we're focused here on this talk on research co-production, but we're not focused on comprehensive engagement between um, university and community. So we're not going to be touching on issues related to student exchanges, and we're not going to be touching on um, too many of the other ethical issues. David? Yeah, so there are so many advantages of using a co-production uh, research approach and um, as we have heard from um, the uh, introductory remarks or key uh, or introductory remarks or opening remarks, there are projects that are already benefiting from uh, using um, a co-production approach, but um, um, evidence or literature shows that um, using a co-production approach um, allows for unique and informed perspectives on research designs for applied research and it enhances the relevance of the research question and thereby increasing uptake and, and use of findings because during the process of co-production, there is that ownership that is built. Um, and then co-production also helps researchers identify practice-based research questions and data that are context relevant. We hope we'll be hearing more of that from the Nigerian and Senegalese projects that have been hinted upon during the opening remarks. Um, co -production, a co-production approach also increases trust and meaning in research process and mutual understanding of the environments. And uh, lastly, um, co-production helps knowledge users understand research findings and develop new skills. Um, according to a scoping review uh, that was done around the barriers and facilitators of co-production, there are, this was done 
uh, in a high income context. But looking at, at um, these barriers and facilitators, uh, as well as uh, IK, IKT approaches, there are some that um, cross cutting and also common within the context that we are um, deliberating upon co-production. Uh, drawing from my experience uh, around working with the uh, Aid Research Coalition in Sub-Saharan Africa, the barriers to, uh, to co-production that um, are common between uh, maybe high income and low income countries include uh, lack of uh, time for, for co-production, lack of funds, um, and then attitudes that people have uh, regarding co-production. These are similar. And um, once these probably are sorted, once we have the capacity, uh, because lack of capacity is such a huge barrier to co-production, but once you sort out the capacity challenges, you build enough capacity for people to engage, um, provide sufficient funding, provide leadership, because co-production is about managing dynamics around uh, engaging of stakeholders. Once you have the leadership, once you have champions, these enable um, co-production to uh, prosper well. Whereas um, uh, some IKT approaches have been documented, for instance, evidence briefs, web portals, uh, evidence also shows that there is uh, not yet a, um, sufficient evidence around which of these is most effective. And what happens is that these approaches have to be uh, used in conjunction with others together as, a, as a, a, a group of them, just not one of them. So um, the barriers and facilitators uh, have been researched, but um, they are common, they're those that are common in the context that we're talking about. And these IKT approaches also uh, need to be looked further into to identify which is basically context relevant. So again, drawing from um, um, the experience of working across uh, supporting eight research coalitions to engage in knowledge translation across Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, from my observation, the power structures and capacity challenges constitute major issues for co-production. Uh, because uh, when you look at power, the way we negotiate power in, in the African context or this is in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, there are underlying, um, um, I mean, if you approach, power is approached using lenses that include culture, political, religious, social and economic um, considerations. And uh, when you look at the way we organize ourselves as communities, people have to think about tribal sentiments, religious and political beliefs. For instance, if I were to come into a project or if I were to begin a project, they'll be asked questions such as, where does he come from? Is he, is he or she a son of the soil? Is, uh, what political inclination does this person uh, belong to? What religious beliefs do they have? And then we, we have a diversity of languages and um, these have implications for communication. Uh, as you might know, each of the contexts we come from has a variety of uh, tribes uh, and organ so, uh, social entities that we, from which we organize ourselves. So if we do not pay attention to these um, uh, dynamics that are within the social, economic, and uh, political spheres that we're operating from and contextualize co-production strategies, then these are just going to be um, reinforcing the hierarchies that are and, and eventually affect co-production. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so I just wanted to orient all of us to where we are in the talk. Um, we've talked about uh, research co-production um, a little bit, but now we want to dive a little bit deeper and um, talk about issues related to power, which we've kind of hinted about, sustainability, digital inequality, and industry partners. So um, I, I, we're going to start off with the big issue, and the big issue is, is power, right? And there, there are different locations of power that um, we want to spotlight in this talk. Um, and one of the locations of power that we don't talk very much about is power within the actual research system. You know, the whole research process is, is the domain of researchers. The, the terminology, the tools, um, the procedures, protocols that are used, 
actually puts knowledge users who might be policymakers, managers, puts knowledge users at a disadvantage from the very start. And so you might see in your projects that there's a power disparity when it comes to agenda setting. So right at the beginning of the project, agenda setting and decision making when a new co-production team is formed. So the dominance of the research worldview in this process um, is then accompanied but by other elements of power. So another location of power is institutional power. And by that, we mean power in the structures um, and in the, in the policies that are, that are there, regardless of what kind of project you're talking about. Um, and so, for example, there's um, kind of authorization or power that's occurring at a national level. And that can, can also include funders. Um, so um, when we think about um, governments and funding agencies coming together, they actually end up making decisions that delimit the work of the co-production team. Right? They, they will be making decisions about funding levels. They'll be making decisions about um, research areas and the priorities within those research areas and um, the priority, priorities that are then eligible for funding. Right? And because of this, um, this institutional power, governments and funding agencies also determine the rules, the requirements, and definitions related to the team. So what I'm talking about here is um, some of these rules, like what does team membership look like? Who can hold the funds? Who is a stakeholder? And who is a knowledge user are often predetermined by um, what we'll call the, inst the low institutional power. So another location of power is what we normally, or what we tend to think about, and that's power among project team members. So there's a, there can be a privileging of particular types of knowledge and knowledge production over others. As an example, knowledge derived from randomized controlled trials might be valued over knowledge derived from experience or expertise that um, a manager or a policymaker might bring to the table. Um, and you know, knowledge users hold valuable knowledge about their lived experience in practice or policy worlds, or about their experiences interacting, in our case, with the healthcare system. And they may face a power imbalance if their knowledge is undervalued. And just to illustrate this further, um, <clears throat> if you kind of look at the different members of, uh, or the different possible members of a research team, you can see very clearly that partners bring different skills, different experience, different education to the, to the table. Um, we can see here um, a policymaker um, might be very well educated, lots of experience with research, perhaps a very high level of authority, whereas um, a pr practitioner or a service provider might be well educated as well, experienced with research, but even within the service provider um, sub community, there's differences in, auth in authority across disciplines and across specialties. So this heterogeneity is going to play out in the research process unless we can actually rebalance the power disparity. And we're gonna talk about how to do this when we get into some of the recommendations. David? And when it comes to um, co-production and sustainability, there is a limited, there are, there, there are limited evaluations of co-production and sustainability. However, literature also indicates that there are concrete changes in service organizations, care environments, and patients are also reported, um, uh, and also patients are reported to be benefiting uh, during or after co-production activities. Um, the implication of this is that um, Sustainability can be accomplished through nurturing and facilitating communities of practice and uh, or networks, which can continue beyond the project funding. Uh, 
And um, regarding partnership with industry, when it comes to uh, the actual meaning of uh, partnership or how it is defined as a set of mutually enab enabling uh, interactions of actors based on common goals and shared intentions, um, what we have currently is um, that partnerships are unbalanced because we have researchers who are perceived to hold ownership of ideas and results. And um, as such, there is limited focus on um, broader spectrum of stakeholders such as um, private sector, media, civil society organizations. These have been described as the third level of stakeholders. Um, and what we have currently is um, uh, the char char uh, is characterized by uh, division of labor. We have academic institutions uh, providing access to funding, expertise in design and analysis, while the other stakeholders or representatives conduct data collection and field work. Um, however, literature also indicates that um, there is an increasing um, engagement of uh, the private sector stakeholders or third level stakeholders in global health research and um, seizing an opportunity to engage these private sector stakeholders is something that uh, needs to be considered um, when, while thinking about co-production. So we wanted to bring up the issue of digital inequality um, within the context of research co-production, um, in part because you know, there's only been a little bit of work done on digital inequality, but much less um, hard, uh, much less work done, if any, on digital inequality related to co-production of development research. So just to, to raise the issue and talk about the issue here, um, there can be inequality um, across different populations, different communities in terms of ease of access to the internet. And more importantly, autonomy to access the internet may differ between people or different, differ between communities. And even if you can access the internet, there are differences uh, among people in terms of their skills to actually find the information that they need, or maybe have the support to find the information that they, they need. Um, there can be digital inequality with respect to um, then even effectively using the internet. So maybe you do find the, the, the right website or the right app or the right program, but whether you're able to use its full features um, can differ uh, across different people. And of course, then we, we can't ignore um, differences in the quality of hardware, infrastructure to connect and different regulatory environments. And this particular inequality, of course, then intersects with the the um, factors that we already know um, produce inequalities, things like gender, ethnicity, um, class, um, which then just enhances um, digital inequality. And why, you know, why is the internet so important? And, and we know this is so important because generally, you know, the, the internet can build social capital. It can provide, um, access to educational or economic opportunities. And uh, the internet can um, support social participation and political participation. Um, as I said, there's not, there's not been a lot of work done in this area, but I do think it's a really important issue. And um, we need to be thinking a little bit more um, about what does this actually mean for co-production. Um, so we're going to move into the recommendations now. We've uh, recommendations for researchers, funders, and policymakers. Um, and it's been a lot of doom and gloom, but um, hopefully we can leave you with some positive um, thoughts. Um, not only do we want to talk about the power digital inequality in industry, but we also want to leave you with some tips for effective grant writing. Um, so first, you know, back to the big issue, let's talk about ways to mitigate power imbalances. And um, on your left, you're going to see some reflective questions that we suggest that the research team can, can use and um, to be thinking about power in their own situation. So the first question you might be asking yourself is, um, in whose interests are we acting? So are we actually acting for a particular community or are we acting for a funder 
or who are we acting for? Um, then you might, the team might ask themselves, who's the explicit or implicit user of this research? Um, it, will it be um, a manager who'll be able to use this research? Or is it that it, will it be government who'll be able to use this research? Or is there an implicit user like industry, which may not be a bad thing, but um, it's worth asking the question. Then the question on the right hand side of um, the blue figure there, what power relations are in play among those doing the work? And when you ask your question, this particular question, we'd encourage you to um, look at the gray boxes here and you may ask this question with respect to your different knowledge users. You may policymakers, administrators, research funders, um, uh, patients or service recipients. But you might also ask this question across the different research stages to determine are there imbalances when we're talking about proposal development compared to interpretation of data. Um, and then finally, I hope the team can ask itself who gains and who loses through this work. And by asking these questions, um, you may be uncovering the values that are implicit in the kind of work that you're doing together. So that, that was kind of a theoretical um, way of approaching it and, and it's a way for the team to be quite reflective. And here are some um, more practical tips. These are involvement processes that you can use, that your team can use to balance power. So starting from the top, what um, you, if, there, if you do perceive um, um, a, a large power imbalance, the team might, might um, bring on a very skilled moderator, a moderator who is really focused on those process techniques. Someone who's able to set some ground rules, who can clarify technical terms, um, maybe someone who's able to seek the views of less vocal participants on the team, basically someone who emphasizes del deliberation and compromise. Moving to the right, um, another strategy that's been recommended is to make sure that you're providing information support to those who maybe uh, have less power on the team. So you're um, taking the time to do some training with them. You um, provide relevant evidence, relevant literature to them. Maybe you're translating some technical knowledge and a technical language um, to help them um, uh, participate fully at the research table. Then at the bottom, um, you might chuckle, but we're also encouraging, this is pre-COVID times, of course, lots of informal social interaction. Um, and that would have been uh, lots of coffee breaks, lots of um, lunch uh, together maybe. Um, and it's really, really important to do that um, because in fact, that will promote mutual understanding and trust um, and a much more productive research relationship. And then finally, um, strengthen numbers. Um, consider adding other knowledge user partners to the team because um, power effects can actually be altered when the ratio of researchers to knowledge users is changed. David? So um, when it comes to um, recommendations regarding digital inequalities, it, it's it's important to be mindful that there may be differences between researchers and knowledge user partners in uh, regard to access to the internet, extent of usage, and use of different devices. We all know that um, we're in an era where smartphones are kind of spreading across the globe, and um, maybe that might be a wrong assumption to think of um, everyone as having access to a smartphone device um, or having the ability to navigate the utilization of these gadgets. And um, also access to internet. When you think of um, the African context, um, I come from Uganda particularly, and access to internet is not um, that a privilege for all. There are places that are struggling with access to internet because um, the internet service providers wouldn't want to invest in that area because the returns on investment are limited. So if you want to engage stakeholders in the co-production process who are coming from areas that are having internet access challenges or lack enough capacity to utilize the gadgets and all, or are limited by the prices of the um, services, internet services, it would be important to jointly determine the best ways for partners to collaborate 
across these regions or countries and understand, have a good understanding of these issues uh, prior to prior or during the co-production process. And um, thinking about um, um, recommendations relating to industry, um, we talked about the engagement of the private sector who are seemingly left out. So it would be important to engage private sector entities in the planning and delivery of services. Um, it would also be useful to nurture opportunities for private sectors to take lead in the implementation and delivery of goods and services. I have previously worked as um, a, an information scientist within the government setting back home. And um, the way the government uh, or public sector operates is kind of bureaucratic. So strengthening informal mechanisms of coordination and adopting the change management style and learning from the private sector industry uh, would be helpful because for instance, the private sector, instead of um, going through the formal process of hiring, training and developing uh, human resources, they usually go outsourcing. Maybe that would be helpful for the, uh, dur during the co-production process. And then when you think of um, the way the private sector mobilizes their resources and the, the, uh, the public sector, uh, and including academia, mobilize their resources, these are different and their strength is in each approach to mobilization of resources. So developing a mixed resource strategy during co-production is also helpful and uh, establishing uh, representative and networking structures that ensure a, a good mix of uh, uh, skills and capacity from both the industry and uh, the public sector and uh, academia would also be helpful. So now I'm going to move on to, to my last two slides and talk a little bit about and provide some tips really um, from my experience reading um, a number of uh, co-production proposals and writing them as well. And uh, um, I thought we, would, we could leave, some, leave you with some tips that might be helpful for the teams, helpful for policymakers, helpful for, for everyone, I think. Um, so in your proposal, I would suggest that you actually describe how the research agenda was set. And the purpose of this is um, to tell the reader that you are focused on the partnership. You are actually committed to the partnership, not just the project. And that kind of description can go a long way. And then you might move into then uh, describing how did you establish the research questions and design uh, collaboratively. Uh, and uh, you can be very explicit. We had a couple of meetings and um, we talked about the research questions. Um, and and it's, uh, it really does show that you've been working together right from the start. Um, moving on to the third bullet, we, we are very um, inclined to describe why the problem is important for the scientific literature. That's how we're, we're trained as researchers. But in this kind of proposal, you really need to also illustrate why is the problem important for the knowledge user partner. Um, and um, that, that, in a sense, um, flags why the knowledge user partner is actually part of this project and why they're going to stay part of the project. Um, you should, uh, you could also, it would be helpful if you detail how actionable knowledge will be generated. So again, um, it may, it's not going to be enough to say that you're going to publish the results in an academic journal, or maybe you might even produce a working document, but really you want to determine how you're going to to come up with knowledge that then policymakers or community members or administrators could actually take up and use actionable knowledge. And our last slide um, in your proposal, please do describe the challenges of engagement. Um, there are uh, there are some theoretical literature out there that you might um, cite, like the scoping review that David um, talked about earlier, but there are also some very practical challenges of engagement, and it, it would serve you well to, to talk about some of those practical challenges of engaging and how you might mitigate those challenges. Um, along with that, you know, acknowledge some of the uncertainty in your project with respect to the partnership and how you're going to overcome that uncertainty. Um, it would be also um, very beneficial to um, provide a governance structure in your in your um, proposal. Um, 
that. Of course, that might depend on how big the project is, but um, if you can demonstrate that you have a co-directorship kind of model or a, um, that, that can go a long way in your favor. And then finally, um, although we didn't talk about these, um, we would encourage you to write about some of the ethical issues that will come up in the partnership and talk about how you have or how you will um, come to common ground on issues related to, for example, intellectual property or um, authorship of articles or um, students and the autonomy that um, the students need to have in, um, in order to complete uh, their degrees, for example. Um, so we're going to pause there and um, uh, invite you to ask questions. Uh, Nisha, will you be coordinating the questions or should I look at the chat? Okay, thank you, Dr. Kothari and uh, Mr. Valugambe for this very interesting presentation. We now have a few minutes, uh, actually a very few minutes for questions. Um, let me ask you, uh, okay, uh, this, there's a question from Rizari Agosu. Um, they are, she's asking, how do you put in perspective power and need? Because I believe that the need of actors has a lot to do in the whole system. So did you get the, shall I read it out again? No, I, I'm, I'm thinking that's a, it's a really, um, a very deep question. Um, it's a it's a great question. There's no I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. So I'm going to give you my my opinion on that one. Um, you know I really think that um, I don't I, I I don't think that actually power is going to be completely balanced. Complete like I don't think power is going to be completely equal in that kind of relationship. People do come to the table with different needs, different expertise. Um, I think the important thing is to have the conversation and to openly acknowledge that maybe there are different stages of the research process where um, someone um, does exert their power for the good of the project. Um, but the important thing is to be, I, again, I think to be um, having conversations among the team, and they're difficult conversations, but have the conversation and acknowledge some of those needs, which in, in part may um, come from the powerful individual or may not, right? They may come from the less powerful individual, but the important thing I think is to have the conversation and maybe use those reflective questions. Okay, thank you. We have, uh, this is the last question we have time to take. Uh, it's from uh, Remoko. Ostendo. I hope I got that correct. Um, so the question is, co-creation is complex, time-consuming, and more open-ended. Should funders allow for longer and or more flexible funding periods for co-creation co projects instead of the typical two to three-year project period? Oh, that's a great question. And there's a lot of discussion about this. And um, where there's a call is to have um, perhaps funds available for a partnership to come together, for a partnership to develop some of those um, ethical uh, infrastructures, as I call them, like uh, authorship guidelines and um, to develop some of that, to develop ways of working together and to maybe document that. Because that doesn't just happen in a one hour Zoom. You know, I've been in um, a five-year research project where the first year we were all, we were behind because the first year was taken up by um, refining the research question back and forth, back and forth, um, developing policies in terms of how our project was going to behave or how we were going to enact our project. So um, to be quick about um, the answer, I would say that yes, there could be more time, but that time and that allocation of funds could probably happen at the front end um, to develop the partnership and to develop that uh, collaborative um, grant. Okay, so unfortunately that is all the time that we have for question and answer. Uh, if you have further questions, I am sure uh, you can uh, email or write to uh, Kothari and Valgambe and uh, get your answers. Um, 
this concludes our first session thanks to every uh, keynotes uh, thanks to the keynote speakers for a very interesting presentation and discussion and to all uh, the questions and active participation so now uh, we can take a 15 minute break but before we leave we want to inform you that uh, when we return, you will be asked to answer a series of questions through an interactive survey. To be able to do that, you must either use the direct link that we have posted in the chat or um, go to your internet browser using your phone or laptop and type the link that is posted on the screen, www.menti.com. And you will have to enter the code 4048764. Again, 4048764 below the link on the screen. So we will leave this info there for a minute or two to give you time to access the page. After that, we will play a short video featuring representatives of different research funding organizations who share their views on the topic of research co production. We will resume in 15 minutes. See you soon. Research funding organization, we encourage our researchers to take on co-produced work because of several advantages. For example, it improves the quality and diversity, it helps to address eminent issues that policymakers are grappling with. Sometimes for political purposes, it helps in terms of the sense of ownership as a project site for acting on the research findings. Co-designed or co-produced research is likely to be more impactful and I think that is why institutions like PEP have taken it on. But we need to know that co-production comes with some challenges and risks. For example, it is expensive. It involves significant personal expenses, both to the researchers and uh, the funders. It also can be compromised to some extent, especially if policymakers are working with the researchers. They could drive the direction of the findings. So credibility issues can be and arise out of this. The research process can also be significantly affected. Therefore, we need to be cautious when we talk about co-production, but it's definitely a very important way to take on current research. At Hewlett, we have several decades of experience investing in partnerships between national researchers and government officials. We've learned that these partnerships have tremendous potential, potential to go right and result in tangible improvements in government programs and policies, and also, frankly, potential to go wrong and waste the most precious resource we all have, our time. So what makes a difference? Well, one factor is the ability and willingness to invest in long-term relationships and collaborations. 
First time collaborations can go right, but we find that the fourth, seventh, tenth collaboration is almost always higher impact than the first. We also find that long-term relationships pay off at really important moments in the COVID-19 response when we see government officials turning for help to people they already know and already trust and who already understand their programs. Second is being willing to have upfront conversations about what both sides need and what they can offer and equally importantly, what they cannot. When both parties have an honest conversation about the constraints up front, really increases the chances of finding something that's a good fit and not wasting time if it's not a match. We see lots of fun more funders supporting collaborations between governments and researchers. This is hugely valuable. But what I'd love to see even more of is funders who are really supportive of putting the needs of the government officials first and of providing governments and researchers with the leeway and empowerment to shape research questions towards both short-term policy questions and long-term government needs. This is very, very powerful, more so than a research agenda that a funder can cook up in a place like California or London. Co-production from the beginning helps to identify the gaps from uh, the government's perspective and hopefully the research that comes out of it is filling that gap and, and that will help maybe to make it useful at the end for policy makers. Yes. So, so research funders have a lot of role to play, right? Uh, because a lot of the work that goes to supporting governments and policy makers are not necessarily top of the line research work, they typically go unfunded, right? Uh, because it's seen as something that either the government should do or somebody should be doing it, but they still need a lot of contribution from researchers, right? Uh, and providing funding in order to be able to support those activities is very, very important. The objective of the Think Africa Partnership is to promote strengthened economic policy making across the Africa region. And one of the principles that we work with is one of promoting the idea of homegrown knowledge and home-owned knowledge. So knowledge co-production is a very valuable way in which local stakeholders can be engaged from an early stage in the research process. But for new evidence to turn into economic reforms and economic reforms that really stick and take hold, it's important that they are internalized and owned by the countries that are adopting them. And so here there's a very important role for the interface between the knowledge community and the policymaking community to actually interrogate these ideas, to assimilate these ideas in a country context, and ultimately for these ideas to emerge as ideas of the country. And in many ways, the, the importance is much clearer to us than, for example, the role of um, uh, economic papers being published in the top ranking American uh, journals. Um, that, that evidence might Proved to be very important, but the process by which that percolates through to the policymaking community may be much more indirect. Whereas those engaged in the in the domestic um, knowledge community are likely to have a much more direct line to these kinds of policy advisors to be immediately um, able to put things in the terms that are relevant to them and to the policy debates that are happening at the time, and so are more likely to be um, called upon. Uh, sometimes at very short notice, but called upon to, to inform those discussions. Pep's experience with research co-production through collaboration between government and academia is that it can be challenging because the two often have different perspectives and objectives. It is, however, achievable and often results to real impact. And 50% of all PEP projects have been used to inform policy in one way or another. It requires adaptation, compromise, and training to better understand the needs and constraints of each other.
the, the topic and question facing all of us working for more justice and more equality and inclusion in our societies is, is a critical one. How can knowledge bring us together? And how can knowledge advance our, our common goals? So the MasterCard Foundation is working across Africa right now. And we recognize that knowledge is a really important piece of unlocking the solutions to the crisis and uh, challenges facing, facing young people across Africa. Um, this has never been more critical than in the COVID era. So I really want to encourage all of you to think you know, critically about how we can come together as various knowledge brokers to answer some of the critical policy questions facing um, the generation ahead. Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, if you haven't logged in to the interactive survey page yet, I just want to remind you, please do it now. The information is on the screen. Open your web browser and go to the website, www.menti.com and then type in the code 4048764 and click submit. We will let you know what to do in this page in a few minutes. So uh, we now begin our second main session, which is a panel discussion featuring members of different PEP project teams. The session will be moderated by Ms. Uh, Matotsi Amizi, who is a senior research consultant at the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa, and also an uh, MNE specialist with the Center for Learning on Evaluation and Results, CLEAR initiative, supporting countries in Africa in setting up evaluation systems. Ms. Amisi has many years of experience working at the interface between research and policy. For 13 years, she worked in different ministries in the government of South Africa. Ms. Amisi, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Anisha. And uh, welcome back, everyone, um, into our panel discussion that's going to now hopefully delve in into some of the experiences of uh, some of our speakers in doing co-production. Um, co and I think it will build in very well from the, the uh, keynote address uh, that we just had. But before we get on to our panelists, we have asked you to uh, go to Mentimeter. So I just need um, Marjorie, I just need to be able to share this my screen. So we've asked you to um, to go to Mentimeters and give us your view on um, you know on the discussion that we're having now, uh, and you've um, all been responding. So I just want to show you what that looks like. So those are the responses we. Um, we have. So if you still want to add on, you can add on. And I just wanted to sort of pause here um, and to uh, to our panelists uh, that are about to talk and also probably to uh, some of the project members who are in, in the audience. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you, you, you have a comment, what you're observing from how people are responding to that question. And the question was, what are the advantages of co-production? Um, and, and seeing how people are sort of ranking them, what they think are critical issues. So I don't know if maybe one of our panelists, if you wanna unmute yourself and comment, or even our, um, uh, our keynote speakers, if uh, uh, Dr. Anita, if David, if you want to comment, this actually is drawn from the input that you just made.
So, Anita. Yes. Yeah. No, I just wanted to get your your comments. We took, uh, you know, just in terms of how people are responding to this advantages of co-production, as you had illustrated them in your in your uh, in your presentation. So, if you and David have any comment uh, to add to how people are responding to it, or what you're observing from the results. Sorry about that. Um, I, I've just been given. Oh. So I'm really encouraged um, by all of these, um, but in particular, we haven't chatted about at all. We haven't chatted about the yellow bar, encourage methods innovation. Um, and so that, I mean, that really dives deep too, in terms of um, the kind of expertise and contextually relevant knowledge that um, people are bringing to the table and matching that up with research methods and feasibility, really, how can we get this work done given our context? So that's, um, I think, really interesting for me to see that listed there. And um, uh, hopefully there'll be further conversation about the methods innovation. Great. Um, and I don't know if, uh, uh, David, if you have anything to add, if not, um, you can also hear from maybe from Dr. Chitalu, if you have any comment from what you're seeing as uh, people are responding. David, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I do not have much to add because I just also participated as I was going through and I think um, uh, what people are noticing is exactly what, it, and maybe what Anita has also highlighted, the innovation pattern being deep. Uh, I think I do not have much to add, add on to that. Yeah. Great, and maybe let's hear from one of the upcoming panelists, uh, if Sviso, any comments? Oh, Dr. Chitalu. Sviso? And feel free for everyone, feel free to also put in your comments. If you uh, have any comments, you can put it on, on the chat. Can you hear me, Matoze? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, brilliant. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. And I, I think it's very interesting results. It's somehow sort of reflecting also my, my personal voting as a somehow link in that. Because I think the relevance of this that this certainly do come along with the co-production part of it and the increase of the because then once you have the relevance of it, of course, the usage will then automatically be the next step to use that. So um, it, it's very interesting result. It seems to be very logical to me. Great. So I think um, this really leads well to the conversation that, so thank you very much everyone for, uh, for, for, your, uh, for your input. Um, so there's just, uh, let's give us a second. This is a second one. Now, still on the same page, you should now see uh, the second question, uh, which is challenges of co-production. So what are the challenges of co-production? Uh, co so still on the same page, still the same code, you can put in your responses. You should be able to put them, um, you should be able to respond just with your own, with your own statement and then we will, uh, prepared to not go on into our panel discussion. Right? Differences in objectives. That's an important one. Capacity of researchers to respond in a timely manner. And in fact, I, I mean, for the person who commented on that, it would be good to hear more about that during uh, the discussion. Availability of funding. I saw somebody also asking questions about, about funding structure and how funding structure can be a, 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 an inhibitor to co-producing. Great. Some interesting things coming up. This issues around time.
right. So for our panelists who are about to make your inputs, take note of some of the things that people are, 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 are also raising in terms of some of the challenges that are faced, reflect on your own challenges that you might have faced uh, in your co-production journeys. Right, so issues around time, power, power a big issue. And I think it'll be good for us to return to this issue around power and, and, and see from practical examples how people have actually dealt with power in their, uh, their co-production roles. Okay, so power, objectives, time issues, complexity, Great, so these are some really interesting things. I'm gonna pause it uh, because, and I think that this gives us some really interesting things to, um, to grapple with as we listen to, uh, to our panelists, but also uh, inviting your own reflection in, 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 because you know, most of you have also been in, in, in this project, you've been uh, involved in some uh, form of co-production of knowledge or engage with it, tried it, uh, or you've been supporting it. And so your reflections as we get into this uh, panel discussion, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really important to add to uh, the discussion. And I think that this conversation is, is really critical. And I think I've had, uh, we've had many people sort of comment about the importance of, uh, or, or rather that, COVID has also made it even more important for us to be looking at how we produce knowledge more uh, collaboratively. Um, and this is something that obviously, as yes, we recognize that research is a public good and it should be a public good. You know, that's why it is publicly funded. And one way of making it a public good is to make sure that it's relevant, which is what you also noted in, uh, in the previous uh, slide. Um, and that it is uh, responding to the needs of those who must act on social issues and resolve, help resolve social issues. And so having said that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna go back to Marjorie um, and we're going to invite our panelists to then come uh, on and share some of their experiences with uh, co-production. And we can get into some of their personal experiences with projects that aim to bring different stakeholders um, together. So today we have, uh, we have four panelists and uh, we're going to hear first from Dr. Chitalu, um, who is an assistant director and a research fellow at the University of Zambia. She's, uh, she's particularly interested in evaluation of interventions and understanding the consequences of uh, implemented policies. And she's gonna share her own experience from Zambia around working with different stakeholders in, uh, in, in research projects. Uh, then after that, we're going to hear from Dr. Francis uh, Mwai Jande, uh, who is uh, a senior lecturer of police, public policy and social sciences research at uh, Mzumbe University in Tanzania. And um, um, Francis is also uh, a member of the Tanzanian uh, Evaluation Association. So he also has that experience of sort of working with government, uh, trying to institutionalize evaluation within, uh, within Tanzania. So we look forward to hearing from them. The third panelist is going to be um, Dr. Binate uh, Fofana, uh, who is an assistant professor at um, uh, F FHB in Abidjan. Her interest areas are in gender, food security, and rural de uh, development um, issues. And the last person we're going to hear from is Dr. Swison Tombella is an economist uh, with keen interest in trade development and climate change policies. And he has extensive experience, uh, you know, spanning public service and private sector. And the way that the panelists are arranged, and I think this was a point that also David and Anita made in, in the keynote address, is just that most of the time when we're talking about uh, evidence, evidence-informed policymaking, there's a lot of work that comes out from the health sector. But each sector is different, and the challenges that uh, actors face in, in, in a sector will differ 
uh, from one sector to another. And so it's great to hear from a variety of, uh, of, uh, of sectors and we, we learn from those experiences. So I'm going to call on Dr. Chitalu to start her presentation and then I will only come back once SPISO is done, once the, um, the, the speakers are done. And please remember, you can post your questions uh, as they're speaking and then we will have the discussion once all speakers have spoken. Okay, up to Dr. Chitalu. Hello, um, thank you for the um, opportunity to share our experiences from Zambia on research co-production with government officials from the Ministry of Health in Zambia. So to start off, um, I think from the onset, um, we as researchers had to determine Okay, we seem to have lost Chitalu. Yeah, exactly. I think that we have uh, some problem with uh, the connectivity of the the panelist. Okay. But, uh, so Chitalu, uh, uh, yeah, it and might be best to. Us. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, so Francis, do you want to uh, please start your presentation so you can move on to uh, Francis' presentation? I think that uh, Dr. Chitalu has been uh, logged out, so it's probably a connectivity issue. Uh, Dr. Francis, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and a good morning for those who is uh, morning. Major, can you put in my slide on the shared, please? So uh, Francis is waiting for his slides. Yes, Marjorie is supposed to share shortly. There we go. Has it she put in? Yeah, so we see your slide now, Dr. Francis. Okay. So good afternoon again to everybody uh, and good morning to others. Uh, so my name is uh, Francis Moyande. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kari and uh, David, for your uh, uh, keynote speech. Uh, eventually, uh, it has touched on the very uh, important issues that uh, I would also like to share. So in my uh, presentation, I'm going to share with you uh, my experience uh, on core uh, production, uh, particularly uh, it is an experience from uh, uh, a research, an ongoing research uh, on experimental uh, impact evaluation to assess the effect of mobile uh, phone reminder text message uh, on property tax compliance in Tanzania. But uh, also I'll give you uh, another experience, which uh, is a uh, beyond this uh, 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 project. So to start with, uh, with the concepts and the promises, uh, I would not go back to what uh, the keynote uh, speakers had said, but uh, I would just want to zoom in on uh, these uh, uh, key words that uh, when we are talking of uh, co-production, we are talking of parties involved. And the parties involved uh, they mentioned, of course, it was uh, the researchers and uh, the uh, the users, the researchers as uh, the producers of knowledge, and uh, uh, the users. In this case, we are talking of uh, the government, but could go beyond the government, could be uh, the private sector, uh, CSOs, right, or, or non-state actors. Uh, that would be uh, the 
involved in the co-production. Now, what we need to note is uh, on uh, active participation of the parties involved. So when you talk of uh, active participation, the experience that we've had that it is from the, um, the problem identification, from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the agenda setting, which uh, uh, the, the previous speakers had talked about. But in the context of uh, our project, it is the engagement of uh, both the parties uh, in the uh, formulation of the project. So we take on uh, uh, the uh, active, active um, participation. But uh, in the due course of uh, uh, today's uh, uh, discussion, there emerged the, the power as one of the critical elements in the co-production. Uh, it emerged from the presentation, but it also emerged from um, the participants. Now, in our experience, that we have experienced the power sharing and the responsibility from the start of uh, the project up to the end. We are still in the process and we are still sharing powers. But uh, we will talk later uh, of the power sharing, what kind of power sharing. We are talking of the power sharing where there is the knowledge base and the power sharing on the, no uh, on the knowledge use or the output, research output use. So researchers are, are best placed on the design, on the methods, on the skills, that is the knowledge base. But on the other hand, there is the power to use the output, uh, the outcome. So what we are talking about, the power to use is the power to influence the knowledge use. And in this case is the uh, government as the the users of the research, because uh, one of the problem that uh, it hasn't mentioned, but uh, it should be mentioned now, one of the problem of uh, research that didn't include co-production co was the low product, low adoption of the produced knowledge. So in order to overcome this, uh, the users have the power to uh, to use the, uh, the, the generated knowledge. Uh, so co-production calls for or requires uh, the horizontal uh, power relations rather than vertical power relations. In our experience, we are talking of uh, uh, horizontal uh, relationship. That is, we have the uh, the, the researchers, we are uh, led by the, the PIs, the principal investigators, but also we have the, uh, the project leader. So that is what we are talking about for the uh, horizontal relationship, where the, the PI with a knowledge base or representing the knowledge base uh, makes decisions uh, in conjunction with uh, the project leader, who is a government uh, uh, counterpart. So this is what we are talking about, uh, horizontal relations rather than vertical relations. Now, let me take you to uh, why co-production is important today. We are talking of uh, co-production today is because, as I mentioned earlier on, that there has been a challenge of low adoption of knowledge, the knowledge that created by uh, the researchers in isolation. And therefore, the recommendations that were given were shared. So you could see a lot of uh, uh, professors um, in uh, universities, in, uh, 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 in the research institutions that they are they have researches that are getting uh, dust. It's because of low adoption. So co-production becomes um, a solution. Uh, consumers of uh, the produced knowledge also becomes, uh, we're not engaged. So if you don't engage the producers of knowledge, definitely uh, 
the research becomes uh, uh, not useful. Can you go to the next, please? So our experience with uh, our paper project, uh, what we know that for sure, the researchers who are the technical scientists are accountable for the quality of research output. And the project leader who is the government researcher, uh, as well as the use of the research findings, uh, stands on the other hand. And this makes a perfect uh, power relation. And in that uh, group, we have the Semiu Regional Administrative Secretariat, uh, who is uh, the government officer. We have the Regional Administrative Secretary in the district level, the Ward Executive Secretary, as well as the village governments that were, were involved in uh, our uh, launching of the project, and we found it to be uh, working very well. We also worked with uh, the Regional Tax Office, uh, who are responsible for uh, working uh, with us and the, they'll be the users of the uh, research output. So with this um, uh, arrangement, we found that it has worked very well and the power relations worked very well. But next uh, slide. Another experience that we have uh, working with the Tax uh, Revenue Authority is that we sat with the headquarters officers at uh, TRA in Dar es Salaam, and the whole point was uh, to get these uh, 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 government uh, officials to buy in uh, the project. And it was attended by high level and technical TRA officials, uh, where researchers described the study and the, the relevance of uh, the study, particularly on increasing uh, tax revenue for improved public services. And on the due cause of describing our, our, our study, uh, it was important to show the result from other countries where uh, similar studies have been conducted. And therefore, this made the uh, easy acceptance of, uh, in, of the project and the buy-in of the project. Next, the last. So what lessons do we bring from uh, uh, the, pro the paper project in Tanzania? Uh, we are bringing lessons and recommendations that we are saying our project received acceptance in the field because the government as the users, in this case, the Semiu Rats, uh, is part of the project. And because it knows the benefits of uh, the, the, uh, the, the expected outcome of uh, the project. So it has been easy uh, to go along. Researchers and the government partners have horizontal relations. There is no power struggle. Nevertheless, uh, there is a power negotiation uh, where it comes. Uh, so researchers retain the scientific power while the government partners have the powers to influence knowledge, uptake and utilization as they would expect in the uh, dissemination of uh, our, our, our results. We also uh, have the experience and bring the experience that both parties are engaged in knowledge production, though at different levels, as we explained level, uh, earlier on. And we, we hope that uh, this uh, power sharing would tell what works to influence property tax compliance. And increasing research knowledge in co-production will in, uh, improve the research impact because uh, if the, the research that is not uh, adopted, the research outcome is not adopted, that would not uh, make sense. So uh, this co-production would improve the research impact. So finally, we encourage the collaborative research work between uh, service providers, in this case, the researchers, and the research users as the government. Because as I said, uh, Matrosi, research is a, a public good. It receives the public funding, and therefore it must increase our uh, impact in the society. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Munoind. So um, I think because of the uh, connection issues, let's go to Dr. Um, Binate, let's go to your presentation and then we'll 
come back to Sviso and then we'll go to um, Chetan. So I should remind uh, if this presentation is going to be in French. So if you want to listen to it in English, please go to the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and then choose English. Vous êtes en partage d'écran. Vous êtes en partage d'écran. Nous voyons votre écran, Docteur Binanté. Voilà. Vous avez simplement à mettre en, en, en présentation, en mode présentation, et là, c'est parfait. Donc, ouais. euh, c'est à vous. D'accord. Merci, euh, Madame la modératrice. Je voudrais... Je suis Docteur Binaté Fofana Namizata. En plus euh, de la présentation qui a été faite euh, disant que je suis enseignant-chercheur, je dirais qu'aujourd'hui, j'interviens en tant que conseiller technique en tant que membre du gouvernement, conseiller technique du ministère de la femme, de la famille et de l'enfant. Donc je n'interviens pas en tant que chercheur, mais en tant que parti gouvernemental. Alors, donc, je voudrais remercier le PEP de nous donner l'opportunité, n'est-ce pas, de participer à cette importante conférence. Étant donné que le sujet a été longuement défini par mes prédécesseurs, en mettant l'accent sur euh, 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 son intérêt, je vais axer mon intervention sur deux points essentiels euh, de par notre expérience, n'est-ce pas, en tant que euh, euh, décideur, à savoir les freins à la recherche, c'est vrai, ça a été euh, dit, les, les, les freins à la recherche collaborative et les leçons Les leçons eh, apprises pour une meilleure collaboration, n'est-ce pas, de, 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 de parler entre chercheurs et décideurs que nous sommes. Alors, il faut dire que euh, malgré son importance, ça a été dit, la relation entre chercheurs et décideurs n'est pas toujours facile. Ce n'est pas une réa, euh, relation linéaire, d'autant plus que eh, très souvent, euh, le sujet que présente euh, le, euh, le chercheur euh, peut ou ne pas être, euh, peut euh, représenter euh, aucun intérêt pour le décideur. Ceci parce que euh, le, le sujet n'est pas pertinent pour le, le décideur et aussi parce qu'il il s'est posé cette question, cette question d'initiative du problème. On en a parlé à travers le pouvoir. Qui a décidé, qui a, a choisi le, le sujet ça, ça, ça peut faire en sorte que ben, peut-être que le, le, le sujet n'est pas pertinent pour, pour, pour le décideur. Et aussi, le problème que le, le chercheur traite, ce ne sont pas des problèmes spécifiques auxquels le, le décideur est confronté. Et ça, c'est d'autant plus important que eh, nous allons voir par la suite. Alors, nous avons les, 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 les données probantes peuvent ne pas apporter de solutions aux préoccupations concrètes du politique. Et ça, ça peut arriver. Et il y a aussi cette question de crédibilité de la part du décideur. Entre décideurs, de la part des décideurs pour le, le chercheur, il y a ce problème d'incompréhension, ça a été dit. Mais c'est d'autant plus vrai que généralement, le chercheur est souvent mal vu, surtout lorsqu'il présente des résultats qui ne vont pas dans l'intérêt euh, euh, du politique. Et donc, en ce moment-là, le politique ne il, il croit pas, il peut ne pas croire, parce que si vous avez des, des résultats contraires, des, des résultats qui sont contraires à la réalité que le politique vit, le décideur vit, c'est clair qu'il ne va pas croire à ce que vous lui présentez. Il y a aussi, euh, et même lorsque nous acceptons, nous, nous apprécions les recommandations qui sont faites, mais il peut y avoir des difficultés de la mise en œuvre de ces recommandations parce qu'il n'y a pas les personnes et ressources pour, la, pour, la, pour cette mise en œuvre, ou alors parce qu'il n'y a pas de moyens financiers pour ça. Et à cela, et cela est d'autant plus vrai que généralement, vous n'avez, vous on, on note une absence de ligne budgétaire qui est dédiée à la recherche au niveau de nos structures. 
par exemple, au niveau du ministère de la Femme, Famille et Enfants, nous n'avons pas de ligne dédiée à la recherche pour soutenir les, 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 la recherche alors que nous en avons besoin. Et d'autant plus que nous parlons de plusieurs problématiques, notamment le, 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 la question des inégalités, la question d'autonomisation de la femme, la question des, des droits des enfants, la question de la promotion de la famille. Et c'est ça qui explique justement notre présence dans ce projet PEP qui, qui parle de, de, de l'autonomisation de la femme dans un contexte d'électrification. Aussi, vous avez les problèmes de communication, de résultats. Souvent, ça a été dit, le chercheur, il a des langages que le politique ne comprend pas. Donc, il faut faire en sorte qu'il puisse comprendre ce langage et, et cela va faciliter, n'est-ce pas, euh, 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 disons, le, la collaboration entre les, les deux entités. Alors, face à ces problèmes, quelles, sont, quelles leçons nous pouvons apprendre alors, de notre euh, situation de, 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 de décideur, et en tant que conseiller technique, ce que je, je, je propose, c'est que le chercheur doit travailler en étroite collaboration avec ceux-là même qui prennent les décisions. Et ceux-là, des, des décisions sur les, les, les résultats que, 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 que ça, 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 son étude va pouvoir mettre à la dis à disposition. Donc, il, cela doit se faire à toutes les étapes de la recherche. Et mieux, ce qui est intéressant, c'est que les chercheurs et les politiques doivent, et même les bailleurs de fonds, doivent définir un cadre d'échange et de concertation à travers des conventions avec des centres de recherche. Ce qui va faciliter l'identification du problème dont on a parlé et de la pertinence de ce problème dans un contexte donné. Ça va faciliter aussi la définition du rôle de chacun dès la conception du projet jusqu'à sa mise en œuvre. Et donc, ça va régler les questions de pouvoir hein, que, dont on a parlé eh, précédemment. Ça va faciliter aussi eh, la connaissance de l'agenda du décideur. Ça, c'est très important. Vous savez qu'au niveau eh, des, 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 des ministères, au niveau des structures, il y, y a une mission qui est assignée à chaque ministère, qui élabore des plans de développement et qui a ses axes prioritaires qui vont être menés à travers des activités. Donc, il est bon que le chercheur connaisse cet agenda-là. Et c'est ce cadre d'échange qui va permettre tout cela. Et comme on l'a dit, dans, la, dans, dans, dans une recherche, il y a plusieurs acteurs qui interviennent. Il y a le gouvernement, mais vous avez d'autres acteurs. Donc, il faut étendre la collaboration à ces autres acteurs Notamment, vous avez des structures techniques qui ont un lien avec le sujet traité. Vous avez le secteur privé, vous avez la société civile qui, pour nous, joue un rôle très, très important. D'autant plus que c'est elle qui, va, qui est sur le terrain, elle va procéder à la, à la sensibilisation et même à la dissémination, à l'engagement des, des populations qui sont, en fin de compte, les premiers bénéficiaires des de projets parce que c'est nous tous, nous travaillons pour le bien-être de nos populations. Et donc, c'est pour dire que en général, ce que nous devons faire, c'est vraiment de privilégier un climat de confiance mutuelle. Cela va favoriser un partenariat gagnant-gagnant. Parce que, comme vous le savez, il faut se faire confiance. S'il n'y a pas la confiance, nous ne pouvons pas travailler ensemble. Et c'est cette conscience confiance là qui va nous permettre de nous mettre ensemble, de travailler pour produire des données, des résultats qui vont orienter les décisions politiques, qui vont orienter les décisions politiques, les, les, les actions à mener, les programmes qu'il faut mettre en place, tout ceci pour pouvoir réaliser l'objectif euh, euh, de développement de nos pays pour le bien-être de nos populations. Donc, euh, je voulais peut-être euh, euh, à travers euh, 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 mettre en pratique, c'est-à-dire en ce qui concerne notre projet, par exemple, d'autonomisation de, 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 de et électrification, vous voyez, nous nous, sommes, nous nous occupons de tout ce qui est autonomisation de la femme. Et donc, en étant dans ce projet, 
nous avons pu euh, 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 voir qu'est-ce qu'il faut pour ces femmes-là. Nous savons très bien que l'un des problèmes, c'est vraiment euh, l'accès à l'emploi, l'accès au financement, pour que les femmes puissent mieux euh, euh, mener leurs activités et surtout tirer euh, profit de ces, de ces activités-là. En faisant cette étude d'impact qui montre que l'électrification des villages est une très bonne chose, surtout pour les femmes qui sont les, en majorité dans, en milieu rural et qui sont parmi les populations les plus pauvres. Et en, montrant, en démontrant que eh, eh, l'électrification a un impact positif sur ces femmes-là, cela va encourager l'État dans sa mise en œuvre de, de son programme. Donc, euh, mesdames et messieurs, je pense que je vais m'arrêter à ce niveau tout en attendant, euh, tout en, euh, euh, vous, enfin, au cas où il y a des questions, nous serons euh, prêts à, à, à répondre à ces questions et rentrer plus dans les détails à travers des exemples concrets. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Binate. Um, and uh, I, I see there's a lot of questions already on, uh, on the Q&A chat and we'll come back to them. Uh, just to remind everyone that you ha we have uh, uh, interpretation. So you just have to select the, your language of choice. So if you are English speaking, please just select English. Uh, and then for those who are French speaking, just select French. And then each time that the, someone is speaking in a language that um, uh, in a different language, then you can still hear the language of your choice. Okay, so on that note, um, we're going to get here from Sfiso also with a short time just to give us his initial input and then uh, to start the, the, the discussion. Sfiso? Okay. Yeah, my presentation. Once again, um, good afternoon and thank you very much, Program Director, um, and for the opportunity also to PEP to come and share some of our experiences in terms of co-production of, of research in the in South African context. Um, I, I, I think I would like to share my experience as both uh, a researcher who's been involved in the multiple research uh, program, but also as a, an advisor to the policy making. Um, institution. Um, the institution that I work for in South Africa is providing the policy advisory to the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. And I think the project that I was involved in, which was driven by the South African team as part of PEP, um, uh, sponsored projects in the African continent, um, investigated one of the very key policies that is so relevant into the developmental challenges that are facing South Africa in today's time. I think it even became more um, relevant during the COVID-19 as it really dealt with the issues of how do you address the inequality and integration of rural and formal economies. We know that South Africa continues to have a dualistic nature of our economy. So without having to spend um, much of the time, uh, really the, the previous speakers have, have shared this really good insight on how what are the advantages of the co-production and uh, what are the challenges that emanate from them if this is lacking. And I think I would like to ride on the same wave in terms of sharing this, the similar uh, um, or echoing the similar um, uh, support into that kind of model as in terms of or influencing or leading into the evidence base from policy formulation. In the, in the main presentation that was done in the previous session, I was very much intrigued by the statement where they said that um, policymakers, I think it was Dr. Um, Natni and, and, uh, and David in their presentation where it said that they, they are two, they are two world. The, 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 the researchers and policymakers are, come from two worlds. Uh, and I couldn't agree more with that statement. In actual fact, I would like to complicate it more and say, but the beneficiaries of the policy also come in a different world than those of the researchers and policymakers. And I think both as a policymaker and as a researcher, while we understand and try to find each other, it's also important to understand the world in which 
the beneficiaries of that policy or that research that they will change their life need to be taken into account during the co-production of the policy so that the three angles that form the relevance of that policy and the implication of thereof are taken into account from the onset of policy for planning and research execution. And I thought, let me just share with South African uh, policy making process. This is by no means cast in stone. It's just a very, a very much generic process that is usually followed, um, which, um, which I think it's important also in, in, in the next slide where I'm, I'm trying to figure out to say, how do we see co-production being relevant? But also at what stage, which I think for me is very important and I wanted to just add in terms of today's discussion that a co-production of research and evidence is important on its own, but the timing and the, and the space in which it comes in during the policy formulation processes, it is very key. Because you might follow that model of co-production of, pol of policy evidence, but if it comes at the latter part of the policy formulation processes, its benefit and its advantages, which we really learned in the previous session, becomes minimal of it. And I think in, in our case, really, it all start about environmental scoping and need assessment, even before you discover whether there's a need of that research or whether there's a need of the policy itself. And I think if the researchers that will ultimately does that the research do not really find themselves participating meaningfully with the policymakers in understanding the, 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 the context and in understanding the underpinning factors on the ground, it tends to be a policy design that does not necessarily resonate with the realities on the ground. And then the consultation becomes very key so that you do not have a research that is sitting from one point of angle taking into account whether it's good models that you're applying or whether it's best practices that has been successful in the international world. But if it has not been tested and linked with the practicalities on the ground in the South African context, it becomes an irrelevant policy. So that co-production and that evidence becomes very necessary because then it leads into the next stage where the usage, and we've shown in the, uh, in the, in, in the in the survey that you've said that the usage and the relevance of it is one of the very key factors of it. So if they are not part of that process early on, they are already being set up for the minimal usage down the line of it. And then usually what then happens if all those policies have met the three steps in the South African context, we have what we call the National Economic Development and, La and Labor Council, which is basically, a, 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 which basically is a structure that test all the policies against all the legalities, the relevance, the economic and the priorities. We talked ahead also with most of the speakers talking about the power dynamics that tends to play on the ground. And in our case, usually this is a process where you are able to ensure that if it's the research that is uh, influencing policy or is a policy that is changing the landscape of the South African economy, in this process, that's where it got tested so that the balance of powers are tested and the transparent and the relevance and the fairness of that policy and research is, is, is tested and ensure that it's in the benefit of everyone so that you are able to remove some of the biasness and the power influence shift that have might happen during the policy formulation or the research development processes. And then of course, the last part of it is the parliamentary process. I'm very happy to, re to, to, to announce as part of our experience is that in our research, some of the, um, the, the research that we, in our project, sorry, um, and some of the policies that we tested and we simulated as part of the PEP projects, um, some of those strategies have been part of these policies that have been taken up in that process of government policies. In actual fact, as of, as of yesterday, our president in our country was um, ex explaining the, the COVID policy recovery plan, which will take South Africa in the next um, uh, five years as it recovers into this um, pandemic that we've seen now. And the whole issue of government infrastructure investment and intervention that are required to uplift the rural economy were really much prominent in that plan that was announced by our, um, our, our, our president in the country. And this is how we are able to see that if the policy is relevant and if the research really did take into account the realities and take into account also the current affairs that are affecting people's life, 
on the ground. And only then the policy relevance and the usage becomes almost guaranteed going forward. Now, what we basically say or think is what it does that mean for us, this is probably my last slide, is that it is very important that researchers, policymakers that will make that decision also understand the underpinning and the, understand the local factors that affect it, that specific, whether you are speaking in the issues of health or whether it's issues of agriculture, whether it's issues of mining, or there's issues of financing or any other challenges that might be facing on the ground that requires a new information to be generated. And that information need to also take into account and the planning of that information and research need to take also into account the historical context of that area or region or space in which they're operating. Because if it doesn't take into account the people, which is both people's culture and people's and, uh, uh, living, live experiences, if it doesn't take into account also the structural constraint and the economic dynamics, if it doesn't take into account also the environmental settings and challenges and beliefs that are there on the ground, you might find that you have the best research output that you've had, and that is also have been tested on the international space. But unfortunately, it does not test the most basic logic in the ground to say, is it relevant into where into those that you're advising for them. So I think for us, that's really what it's all about when we're talking about co-production of evidence and research for policy influence going forward. And of course- Sorry to interject, I'm just watching time. Uh, so okay. if you could just, yeah, wrap it and then- Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Ozzy. You, you're doing a good job there because I can go all the way. Um, so uh, another issue which I think it was very important and uh, um, somehow I've made that one point as well as to say the researchers and the, and the design phase and the execution become important. One of the issues which we've seen even in the past presenters, they were talking about the trust, the trust deficit that tends to happen. And in a co-production, it's not only about the resources and the knowledge that you put, but also the resourcing of that research. Usually it, it's one of the key elements that tends to remove the trust deficit of it. So if the research is funded through the blend and financing system that covers both the researchers and the, the users of that policy, it usually already uplifted it into making sure that there's a, a full um, endorsement and the usage of that, of that research that will be coming out of it. I've already talked about the, res the resonation with the realities on the ground, so I won't repeat that part of it. So really in, in, in a very nutshell uh, program director, what I wanted to just share with the experience that it is important that the timing even of creating this core production of the research, it comes in at the onset of any processes that you wanna change. And I thank you very much for your opportunity. Thank you very much, Fiso. And sorry about that again. Um, and as we go to Chitalu, I think it would be good for our panelists to start thinking about some of the questions that have been asked. And there's a there's an important question that has been asked by Aisha and, and somebody else who asked anonymously around the cost of co-production. Uh, so if you can start reflecting about that and, and share how, how you cover those costs and also what the costs were of involving everybody. Um, and then also, I think the second question to sort of already start reflecting on is uh, reconciling the different and com sometimes competing objectives of the different partners uh, in the research process. So if you can be ready to uh, respond to some of those questions. Uh, Chitalu? Chitalu, you need to open your microphone, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matsozi. And uh, sincere apologies for uh, dropping off earlier due to the bad connection. So I'm here to present our experiences in working with the Ministry of Health in co-producing evidence on the study that we're doing on experimental impact evaluation of a community results-based financing in Zambia. So I'll speak about our experiences um, through the various stages of the research. So from the onset, um, I think we needed to decide which ministry to work with, given that as researchers, we work with um, um, government officials from various ministries. So we realized that we had a good working relationship with the Ministry of Health and it would be relatively easier to engage with them for this particular project. So as researchers, we identified a research problem based on our understanding of the health sector, as well as the existing data. And, um, 
we discussed with the help with the government officials to determine first of all the relevance and also to refine the problem so that it would be relevant and they would be able to um, implement the recommendations that would come from the study. And also because of the limited resources, we engaged with them to be able to identify the options which would be relevant for them because for our um, experimental design, we had two options that we needed to use. And so we engaged with them to find out which one of the two would be actually particularly relevant for them. And they were able to advise us and we were able to implement that. So in the, in the process, again, there was a requirement that um, team members, the researchers, as well as the government officials needed to undertake a course and do the assessment as well. But then with our colleagues from the Ministry of Health, there were diverse um, skills. And so we had to work closely with them to ensure that um, they had a good understanding of the material that was being uh, presented and ensure that they also successfully completed the assessment. So we were working together as a team to understand what are the skill sets within our, our team. So also as part of our study, before implementing the intervention, we needed to undertake orientation visits. So to do this, we had to go to the sub-national level. And for that, we engaged with the Ministry of Health and formed teams such that it consists, each team consisted of a researcher as well as official from the Ministry of Health. And that really worked out very well because we were able to get the support that we needed when we went to the sub-national level. And also uh, due to the COVID pandemic and the restrictions that came about, at some point we were not able to go in the field to collect the data. So we engaged the officials at the sub-national level and provided some complementary support and they were able to assist us to collect the data. So we were able to work quite well with the officials at the sub-national level. So however, there were some challenges that we faced. So for instance, whilst we were out in the field collecting the data, um, doing the orientation visits, our government officials, because this project was not part of their official responsibilities. So at the time they had, they were called back and they had to leave the field because they had to attend to other official duties. So we as researchers had to um, come up with another plan to ensure that we were able to still complete our exercise on time and we managed to do that. Also at, in terms of engagement, we were engaging particularly with the officials at the headquarters as well as the provincial level. But when we went out in the field, what we found is that the district level officials also wanted to be engaged, to be involved um, more than they were actually being involved at that point. So they, they actually raised an issue that, um, that they wanted to be more involved in planning the field work compared to the way we had the level of involvement at that stage. So that was one of the issues that, that came up. But eventually, I mean, the work went smoothly and were able to complete the assignment. So the other issue was uh, in preparing for the intervention, we had to collect some other data from gov other government officials who were not part of the core team. So we received a request uh, to co-opt these other members, but that was not feasible given that um, we had already formed this team with the other uh, government officials who were already on the project. So in terms of um, highlighting the key factors for success, so having this pre-existing good relationship with the Ministry of Health really helped us to ensure that we were able to schedule our meetings, set up appointments, and we had a, quick, a very good interaction with them. It was really easy for us to get the data and the support from the government officials because we had this pre-existing Okay, so uh, exactly, Matsuzi. I, I feel like uh, with the middle management, we needed to consult with the middle level government officials, and then we would only liaise with the senior government official as and uh, as 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 necessary. And also, the fact that we had dedicated funding for this project ensured that we were able to compensate the team members for the time spent on the project, and this ensured that committed and able to deliver when they were called upon. So finally, we, we note from our experience that it's usually easier when you want to generate evidence from activities that are actually planned by the government because then it guarantees full participation by the government officials. And it's actually quite easy to implement the recommendations that come from the work that is actually initiated by government officials. So 
it's important as researchers that we need to engage closely where possible as the government is developing their work plans so that we plan to jointly uh, generate evidence for policy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sitalu, and thank you so much to all our panelists. So uh, we'll get on to the questions. Uh, we have, uh, I think, 17 minutes for the questions, um, if I'm right, Marjorie. Um, and so maybe just quickly got to the questions that have already been raised. So the question around the cost and the timing around um, co-production, and then also um, this uh, question around reconciling different uh, objectives. But I want to add a third question there, um, which I, I see there's a bit of a discussion going on uh, with different people posting questions that are related to whether co-production is um, a suitable uh, approach for all forms of research, or whether they're different researchers, different um, uh, with different approaches to research needs to be uh, taken. So maybe let's start with you, Francis, um, and then we'll go to uh, another panelist. You're muted, Francis. Right. Um, once again, thank you very much for giving me uh, this opportunity to um, respond to these questions. Uh, definitely, uh, the issue of uh, cost in uh, co-production uh, is uh, inevitable. Uh, given the fact that uh, uh, researchers have the primary role of uh, researching, uh, so they can uh, uh, plan and invest their time uh, for research. I'm speaking this, uh, for instance, uh, in my uh, university, I think it's uh, um, also true uh, to other universities that uh, we have the the primary mission in our universities to generate knowledge and so uh, research uh, is part of my job and uh, is counted uh, as as part of the expected uh, outcome or deliverables but um, uh, on the other hand the government or the users uh, research is not their core functions. Uh, some of them are on the uh, service providers. So uh, getting the time, which is again, it is a costly time, it might not be uh, uh, feasible uh, to, to be taken uh, equally. Um, and so the same that uh, I'm costing my time uh, with that value. But uh, given the civil service uh, regulations, it might not be also possible to uh, engage the government official on the same uh, level. Uh, nevertheless, we're saying everything has a cost. So we cannot uh, uh, escape from this uh, cost. But we possibly be talking on how do we uh, minimize the cost? So the cost, yes, will be there. Thank you. That's a great point. And just to remind our panelists, please keep your videos on so that um, people can see you as they engage with you and uh, you respond to the questions. So maybe, uh, Dr. Binata, maybe your, your comment around um, reconciling these different objectives and needs within a, a project that you're, you know, attempting to co-produce knowledge together. Madame, est-ce que j'ai pas bien compris? Elle peut reprendre? La question c'est? So, yeah. So just your 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 response and your experience around balancing different needs and objectives of researchers, of policymakers, politicians, uh, beneficiaries uh, in the co-production of, uh, of knowledge, of evidence. D'accord, merci. Uh, <laughs> je pense que uh, l'équilibre viendra du fait que uh, on, on crée un cadre d'échange. Comme je l'ai dit, 
le politique, il a des objectifs à atteindre. Le chercheur, il doit aider logiquement le politique à atteindre ces objectifs-là. Et donc, souvent, effectivement, il peut avoir des, 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 des intérêts divergents, mais justement, je pense que c'est le rôle de la coproduction. Dès lors que nous allons nous mettre ensemble pour, pour travailler sur un sujet d'intérêt commun, je pense qu'en ce moment-là, à travers le dialogue, à travers les différents euh, euh, objectifs, nous pourrons nous attendre sur euh, quelque chose qui va non seulement être euh, 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 utile pour tout le monde, mais qui va aussi permettre d'être mis en œuvre pour, euh, euh, pas, pour, euh, pour le besoin des populations. Parce que quoi qu'on dise, le politique, son objectif, c'est d'assurer la sécurité, c'est d'assurer le bien-être de la population. Et certains domaines, cela n'est pas toujours évident. Et parce que vous avez des phénomènes dont les ampleurs sont différentes. Je vais prendre le cas de la COVID que nous vivons actuellement. Vous savez, il y a eu des impacts, il y a eu des effets suite aux différentes mesures qui ont été prises de confinement. Surtout quand je prends le cas des femmes, vous avez, on, on a, il y a eu des études même déjà qui ont montré que ça a eu un impact négatif sur les femmes. Et donc, mais on ne connaît pas l'ampleur de cet impact-là. Et comment le savoir C'est la recherche qui va nous dire exactement quelle est l'ampleur du phénomène et quelle est la stratégie, quelles sont les politiques que nous devrons mettre en place pour pouvoir justement réduire ces effets-là. Donc, pour dire que quand nous regardons l'objectif final, je pense qu'il est bon qu'à travers les dialogues, qu'à travers les échanges, que nous puissions nous mettre d'accord sur un objectif qui va nous permettre, qui va être, permettre d'avoir des résultats, résultats qui vont être utilisés pour améliorer les conditions de vie des, des populations. Voilà. Donc, je pense que c'est ce que... Et puis, et puis comme je l'ai dit, hein, c'est tout, hein, tout un ensemble de personnes. Parce que quand vous, pouvez, vous prenez un sujet, ça peut concerner certains, soit je prends le cas du ministère de la Femme, Famille, Enfants, mais ça peut concerner, par exemple, notre projet de PEP qui porte sur l'électrification, mais ça, étant donné que euh, il y a le volet femme, ça concerne plus le ministère de la femme parce que, et, et, et ça concerne aussi d'autres ministères. Vous avez les femmes qui sont en milieu rural, dont l'activité principale, c'est l'agriculture. Donc, vous avez le, le, le ministère de l'agriculture qui rentre en jeu. Vous avez les questions des changements climatiques, vous avez les questions d'environnement. Ça va faire que vous avez le ministère de l'Agriculture qui va aussi intervenir. Et c'est un ensemble. Et vous avez, quand vous avez vos résultats, vous avez aussi les ONG qui sont les porte-voix des de, de pouvoirs publics. Ils disent ce que nous n'osons nous, nous pas dire. Donc, ONG, les ONG ont un rôle très important, surtout dans la sensibilisation, et faire en sorte que les populations soient informées, soient engagées dans le processus. Parce qu'il faut le dire aussi de par nos expériences, si le, les populations pour qui vous travaillez ne sont pas engagées dès le départ, vous allez produire de bons résultats, mais dans la mise en œuvre, vous allez échouer. Donc, c'est vraiment tout cet ensemble-là qui doit vraiment, dès le début, durant tout le processus, faire ensemble pour, euh, et, 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 disons, pour bien réfléchir sur les différentes euh, les étapes, tout, sur les, 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 tout ce qu'il faut faire pour que avoir une production des données probantes qui soient utiles pour nos États, pour le développement de nos pays. Very much. And, and you touched on a very important issue around NGOs. We have talked a lot about policy makers, policy actors, but there are other users of evidence outside of the public service. And I think that's an important point in terms of how do we get those involved. And I think maybe just um, with the time we have, if, if, so if you, you you have worked also with, with government and within government, just this questions around different types of, of um, research. There's sometimes that's demand driven. I think this is a question also asked by Milu. There's times that research is demand driven, there's times that it's supply driven. What are the opportunities for co-production in these different forms of, uh, you know, supplying um, research from your experience, you know, working from within the public service? Um, and, you know, and probably throwing a spanner in there is, you know, are there 
times when uh, we don't need to co-produce, are there times where a different approach to research uh, is needed to add uh, into the knowledge base? So if you can quickly respond to that, and then maybe we might be able to take another question. But let's see. No, no, certainly, uh, Matosi. I, I think the demand-driven um, research is usually the one that is um, <clears throat> very much used and relevant in most cases uh, becomes the applicable one. Because you find that most of the supply-driven policies perhaps might be a special program or a grant fund that is driving that, which might not necessarily take into account all the realities and the advantages that we've spoken about earlier on. So I think it is important that even if it's supply driven, but to test whether the demand for it and the usage of it will be, is it there and will they be able to be completed? I think that is very important to strike that balance of it. Um, the last part of it I wanna just uh, touch on uh, is the whole issue to say, even on the earlier one, on the cost of the co-production of these policies that I think in our experience, whether the, it, it, the cost of not co-producing is probably much higher, the opportunity cost of it because of the different actors that you've talking about and the challenges that tends to come along with that. So I think that would be the point I wanted to emphasize there. Thank you, Spisa. Uh, and and there's, there's, I think, enough now showing the value of sort of making that investment. And I think that goes to the call to funders of research to sort of invest the resources for uh, to be able to involve policymakers, other users within the research process. There's a specific question to, um, to Shitalu around how you made the decision around the methods that was used. Uh, in your uh, in your project, was there something that was done by researchers, or was there something that was done together with the actors, with the policy actors? Okay, I can't see Shitalu. Shitalu. Shitalu is logged in, but she has a connection okay. problem. So, so take question with the five yeah. minutes we have. My um, okay. So there's a question around what of research that has not been co-produced. How do we encourage use or enable use? Does it mean that research that has not been co-produced is completely lost? And maybe we can hear uh, just uh, quickly from um, Dr. Uh, Anita. Kotsari and uh, David, uh, if both of you can maybe just make a quick comment and then we can wrap up. David, why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, the research that hasn't been co-produced um, is not lost at all because um, you could do retrospective, you could apply a retrospective approach to um, trying to make use of it. and. Uh, uh, some of the ways or the IKT approaches that have been tried, for instance, uh, we have researchers that have worked on soil projects and produced their research. And, um, there are avenues, for instance, you have your research findings. Mostly researchers would, would target publishing uh, their findings in, in, journal, uh, in journal articles and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. But um, if you have your research findings that were not co-produced, one way is to find avenues of um, engaging the potential users of that research because the, the audiences that were meant to have that research. So much as it may not have been co-produced, you could do a retrospective way of trying to find ways of um, engaging the users and talking about the research findings and then showing them the utility of these research findings. Um, some other ways, um, other than the policy dialogues, would include, for instance, breaking down the findings in a language that is accessible and um, uh, you could package that in newspaper articles, lay newspaper articles that people can find. Uh, if you have a, an audience that probably does not read or may not understand the language, the alternative ways as um, edutainment where you package your research findings in a manner that is uh, accessible by the audience that you're targeting. You could use a skit, you could use uh, um, maybe Currently, people are using blogs, but uh, depending on the audience, the target audience of the findings, you may need to start thinking, how do I now make my research findings? Much as they were not co-produced, how do I find ways to engage with the users of the research findings? And that calls for devising appropriate uh, mechanisms to reach out to, the, to that audience. Great. I, I think we, we, we've... Uh... 
exhausted our time for the for the for the discussion. Thank you so much, David, for that uh, input. I think as, as a reminder to all those who are involved in sort of knowledge production that it you know it's not the end if it wasn't co-produced. There are other ways to sort of engage with policymakers, with other users of uh, of evidence. We we I mean as researchers we have to of course be willing to put ourselves out there. So I think just wrapping up this discussion, which has been a really fantastic discussion, and there's a lot of more questions on, on, on chat and then also on the Q&A chat. So I will advise the panelists to please go on the chat and just respond to some of the questions that maybe we didn't get to uh, for, for live uh, responses. But just to wrap up, I think there's important issues around the time it takes, but I think I really like what Sviso said about the fact that the the, the benefits far outweighs the cost of, 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 of uh, um, doing research in a more collaborative way and producing knowledge in a more collaborative way. There's issues, I think, around relationships and building those relationships that enables co-production to work more smoothly and investing in that, which talks to the issues around resourcing. And this is really a call to uh, those who are in government, there's a point about government funding research, those in government to make sure that research is being funded, but funded in a way that allows for the time to, um, to collaborate uh, in, in its production. And, um, and I think we'll stop there uh, and then we will try and respond to some of the, some of the questions on, uh, on chat. Thank you very much to, uh, to our panelists. Thank you very much to our keynote speakers uh, for continue also to engage in the, uh, in the Q&A. We will continue the, the discussion in, on chat. Thank you very much everyone for your, for your really uh, engaging questions and for your input. Uh, and then I'm handing over to Anisha. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Amazi, and uh, to the four panelists. It was a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I think it helped us to make uh, our research more relevant and um, to prioritize and uh, uh, even to uh, how to get the policymakers involved so that uh, we can get the information that we need to do the research. So this co-production, it's a, a very useful way to increase the relevance of um, our research altogether. Um, I would now like to invite Professor Mariara to join us again to share a few concluding remarks and to present the PEP Best Practice Award. Okay, thank you, thank you everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Wow, it's so exciting. It was so exciting to listen to all the speakers. Uh, we've run a lot from that session and uh, very interactive on the chat. There are still a lot of uh, interesting debates going on, not just questions. But mine is simple. Let me just uh, go to the final session for the interest of time. Uh, I'll talk about our best practice awards and also give a vote of thanks. So first, let me just go back to the panel that has just finished uh, to thank very much Matonzi Amisi and the panel for your very thoughtful reflections on this very interesting and relevant topic. As I've said, we have learned a lot. Uh, from you, and I really loved the whole idea of uh, the interactive session. I was expecting more of it to answer it, but it was really exciting, and we should be having more of that. I, overall, I hope that today's inform future collaborations between knowledge producers, knowledge brokers, and knowledge users. And, and I hope that uh, we can conversation uh, forward. We will not leave it at this point. So at PEP, uh, we sincerely believe that uh, we must be informed by high quality locally generated evidence. Uh, and this is why all our projects 
go beyond analyzing a policy issue. Uh, and they are conducted in consultation and in collaboration with the relevant policy stakeholders. You've seen for yourself first had that we are actually working, uh, co-working together as teams. And speaking of this, uh, now I'm very excited uh, to talk about our 2020 uh, PEP uh, Best Practice Awards. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we created the Best Practice Awards to underline the importance of uh, simultaneously embracing the scientific and policy engagement sides of the projects. Uh, and of the teams coming to the end of their projects, uh, this recognition is awarded to those who have made outstanding efforts to pursue uh, both the highest scientific research standards, uh, while at the same time engaging with policy stakeholders to ensure that uh, their evidence informs critical development policy decisions. And we've had a lot of uh, about this uh, this afternoon. So this year we recognized two teams. Uh, I know the teams now should be, the 14 teams should be holding their breath because they don't know who it is. We have one team from the macro micro policy modeling group and one from the microeconomics analysis group. Uh, so I'll start with the uh, best practice award that is going to go uh, to the macro micro policy modeling group. And this goes to uh, Christian Joshi, Ruada Baroki, Miriam Buruba, Faustin Kabare, Mapedo Muraini, and Sizina Maua for their work on the project, impact of progeda public policies in agricultural sector on women's employment in a context of economic dependence on natural resources. And this is a, st a study in the, of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. DLC. Uh, can we say congratulations to the team? There's a reaction box there. You can uh, clap for them before I go to the next one. Congratulations, team. Then the best practice award for the microeconomic analysis group goes to Dieta von Vintel, Martin Moale, Aja Smith, Tony Mueda Kaninga. Kadrin Mandaru and Joy Omakalim for their work on the project, the unintended consequences of the Marawi Farm Input Subsidy Program, women's entrepreneurship, and financial inclusion. Again, congratulations, team. Congratulations, congratulations. Join me in congratulating them. So, uh, along with the research directors and, of course, the mentors uh, for the two groups. Uh, we have the research directors, Margaret Chitiga, Edruka, Tibeti. Uh, I warmly congratulate both teams uh, for their outstanding work and dedication. And uh, we'll be sending the prizes and certificates to the teams in the next few weeks. If we had uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, of course, we would have hugged them. Uh, this does not mean uh, that the other teams have not worked as hard. In fact, they have worked very hard. We are very proud of all what the teams have achieved so far. Uh, but as we know, in every game, there is a winner. So let's again say congratulations to the winners. OK, now coming to close, as we know, adversity often brings out the best in people, just as necessity drives innovation. Uh, we have certainly seen this due to, I mean, we've seen this to be true during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, across the group, people have sought new ways to communicate, making the world a little a bit smaller and better connected. In fact, we know that digital technologies have improved and the opportunities for online meetings and research uh, have improved. And therefore, researchers and policymakers have had to run to use the technologies during the pandemic. And this is what we have seen over the last four weeks with our researchers and policy makers uh, being able to interact very actively. Uh, we may not be convening in the way that we have become accustomed, but these connections have allowed us to overcome many of the barriers that physical distance traditionally imposed. And we have found a common humanity uh, striving to improve well-being 
and protect the environment. Uh, you can think about reduced carbon emissions and also protecting the most vulnerable uh, by not exposing them as they travel. And of course, we expect that the, the, the pandemic is going to discourage future traveling. So really we have to adapt to uh, the new normal. So uh, your presence at and participation in that, this virtual conference uh, speaks to the importance of the cause we are working towards that is driving development in the global south so that no one is left behind. And now, as the executive director of the Partnership for Economic Policy, and on behalf of all at PEP, I wish to express a sincere vote of thanks to everyone who has made today's event and the wider 2020 PEP annual conference so successful. Uh, thank you to our key note speakers, Anita and David, for your illuminating keynote presentation. We learned a lot from that. And thank you to our panelists, uh, Namizata, Sifiso, Chitaru, and Francis. Uh, you have certainly given us a lot to consider, and you saw the very lively discussion that was going on. Thank you also to Matonsi and Nisi for moderating this discussion and drawing very insightful conclusions. And thank you to everyone who attended, uh, for those who actively participated in today's discussions, your input is invariable. And for sure, we'll be giving you uh, feedback uh, as we uh, conclude on this. Thank you again to our donors. Uh, thank you to the International Development Research Center, uh, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation at Global Affairs Canada for supporting this event as part of PEP's current activities. Uh, thank you also to UK Aid, uh, the World Bank, and UNICEF, as well as our partners and collaborators for supporting uh, PEP, uh, the activities this year. I also want to uh, give a vote of thanks to all members of our board uh, for your support and leadership, and a special thanks to Fred Carden, our board chair, Dominique, the, uh, Van Duel and Shiabo Hang uh, for sharing several sessions over the last one week. Uh, thank you to all our scientific and policy mentors for your hard work preparing and participating in the conference, as well as supporting the project teams during a particularly challenging year. Your dedication to PEP's mission is greatly appreciated. In fact, the prizes that we have given to the researchers really uh, a joint, a co-production uh, between uh, the scientific and policy mentors and the researchers themselves. Uh, finally, thank you to all uh, PEP project team members for your participation over the past few weeks in our activities and for all the hard work that you have achieved over the last one year. Uh, thank you to the PEP staff, uh, Global Secretariat for organizing uh, conducting uh, this conference. A particular uh, thank you to Marjorie and your team uh, for the four intensive weeks uh, that you have uh, had to endure. This year's event was the 18th uh, general meeting, but it was the first to be held online and co coordinated between teams that are based in three countries. Uh, in, sorry, in three continents, actually, not even three countries at different time zones, because uh, then we have our team in Latin America, we had our team in Canada, and we had our team in Africa. So I would really want to sincerely thank everyone uh, with us today for attending. Last uh, but not least, uh, when I still have your attention, I want to tell you that uh, we have another upcoming online PEP event. Uh, we'll be hosting a special, a special session at the What Works Group of Summit uh, on the 3rd of November. We'll be presenting and discussing PEP's approach to designing and contextualizing research for specific policy use. Uh, we will share all the details about this activity very soon. Uh, please uh, look out for our correspondence and we'll also be indicating how to register for the same. So I hope we'll see you on that of November. It will only be a one and a half hour event. So please mark your calendars. 
And uh, with that, this concludes our 2020 PEP annual uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again. And goodbye.